everyone. We're a place where it is okay to not be okay. My name's Nick. I'm here with the incredible Aaron Cison. <laughs> we are so excited to kick off this weekend with you. Yes. And hey, one of the things we love doing around here, and we'd love if you got involved with us, is we love giving shout outs, especially yes. to our online family. So what you can do is you can let us know in the chat box below where you're watching from, your name. We wanna give you a shout out here in just a bit. We want our online family to feel just as much a part of Central Absolutely. Church as our in-person family. Yes, we're so glad that you're joining us. And last week, we wrapped up an incredible summer series. It was all about the life of David. Pastor Nick gave some incredible messages along with Pastor Judd. And last weekend, we talked about some incredible next steps, how we can dive deeper into God's word, how we can worship him. We're excited for the series that Pastor Judd is kicking off this weekend called Follow Him. But one of those things we talked about last weekend was first step. You wanna talk about that a little bit, Nick? Yeah, one of the things we hear often around here, Aaron, whether it's from our online family, it's from um, our different in-person locations, is that yeah. people wanna take a next step. They wanna get more involved in this church. They just don't know what and they don't know how. And so if that's you, you're not alone. There are a lot of people that feel the way you do, mm -hmm. but we also have a solution. And that solution yes. is First Step, where you can find out all the different steps you can take right here at Central, something that matches up with where you currently are in life, where you're currently in your walk with Jesus. So it's really easy to sign up, right, Erin? Yes, it is. All you have to do is visit central.family and click First Step. It's gonna be available online or in person. We really hope that you can join us. It's coming up on August 27th from 12 to 4. But right now, let's get ready to worship with our Central family.
keep this party going. We just want to welcome you. My name is Erin. This is Pastor Nick. We're excited to be some of your hosts today at Central Online. We're so glad you're joining us online. This is a place where it's okay to not be okay. You can come as you are. You belong. We're so glad that you're here. And summer's officially come to an end, it's Nick. That's done. sad. But we're ready to kick off the fall with a big party because next weekend is back to church bash. It's going to be awesome. And we want to make it easy for you to invite a friend. Yeah, that's right. There's probably a lot of you out there. You're already thinking about all the things back to school, especially if yes. you're a parent. How do I get my kids back to school? Well, don't forget about also coming back to church and getting in that rhythm. And we are having a fun weekend this next weekend to kick amazing. that off. Now, here's why we do fun weekends and make them extra special is because we want to make it a lot of fun for the central family, but we also want you to invite a friend. In fact, Jesus himself tells us in Matthew 9, 37, that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Absolutely. And so Aaron and I 
can talk about next weekend. We can. All we can and try to yes. get the word out, but you can help by inviting your friends, by inviting your family so that they can experience the hope of Jesus. So make yes. sure to invite them this next weekend because you don't know what they'll be missing out on if they're not here. It's going to be incredible, but summer ending also means that we just wrapped up our annual backpack drive. And because of your generosity, we were able to bless hundreds of kids with supplies and other needs for school that they wouldn't have been able to get for themselves. And it was amazing. I got to be there, but check out this video for more. Hi, Central Family. Pastor Lisa here. Over the past two weeks, thanks to your generosity, we've been able to provide backpacks, school supplies, and so much more to hundreds of kids in need. First, we had our annual backpack event where we blessed over 700 kids. They had the opportunity to pick out their own backpacks, pack them with great appropriate supplies, and families receive food resources and snacks for school lunches. This school year should. I'm hoping it's gonna be a good school year because I just got blessed with all the school supplies and backpack. And I think this year is gonna be a great year. It's gonna help me with, you know, like my work that I have for high school and my mom won't have to worry so much about uh, getting it from the store and everything. Like it's gonna help so you can go to school and you can learn and get education. Just wanna say thank you. Then, this past week, our care team delivered 600 additional backpacks to schools in need across the valley. Central family, none of this would be possible without you. Each one of these numbers represents a child in need, a child who, without your generosity, would have gone without. Because of you, over a thousand kids will start the school year with hope. Hope that comes from knowing people care about their needs, hope that they're not alone, and most importantly, the hope that comes from being introduced to the love of Jesus. Thank you, Central Family. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Central Family. Thank you, Central Family, so much for getting me my backpack and school supplies. Thank you. Thank you, Central Family. Thank you, Central Family. Thank you, Central Family, for blessing us with this backpack. We very much appreciate it. Thank you, and she appreciates it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Your generosity has left a lasting impact for each one of these children and their families. Thank you for continuing to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Come on, that's beautiful. I love the heart of generosity of this church. And you know, it's easy to get involved if you want to give of your time or talents. We'd love to meet you and help you get plugged into a new ministry season. If you want to give financially, you can go to central.family, go to centralonline.tv, go to centralchurch.online. There's several ways that you can give electronically, or you can simply find one of our generosity team members out in the lobby right after our experience and walk up to them and you can give by credit or debit card or you'll find our ushers having offering buckets. But listen, Central, your financial contributions are impacting lives, what you just saw in that video. And God's not done. We believe that tens of thousands of people's lives will be impacted in this valley because of your generosity and lives will be forever changed. So on behalf of those that you'll be impacting, thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for making such a huge impact in their life. Let's go to God in prayer. Will you join me? Well, Father, we love you. And it's your love that compels us to love others. It's your love that compels us to give. It's your love that compels us to serve and to make a difference in this world. God, we are your hands and feet. We are the hope to the world. And God, I pray right now that you'd put your hand of favor and blessing on every person that's a part of this weekend experience. God, bless their lives, bless their families, bless their health. Bless them in ways they can't even fathom or imagine. And may they experience you richly and deeply. And may they meet you in a, in a new way, knowing that you're doing a new thing in their life right now. And we welcome you into our worship, Jesus. We want to exalt you and lift you on high. And we pray that you would wrap your ever-loving arms about us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen.
Bring your burdens, bring your pain, and bring your words, your hurt, bring your shame. We don't need them anymore, cause we are standing in the presence of the Lord. God is in this house. God is in this house, and that's all that matters now. That's all that matters now. Be forgiven. Be restored. And find your healing. So much more. Sing this together. Come on. God is in this house. God is in this house. And that's all that matters now. That's all that matters now. We declare that. God is in this house. Oh, God is in this house. And that's all. summer uh, I took a little road trip up to Utah and I was driving just throughout the whole state and it was just so pretty and I get to this small town and I meet this gentleman who lives there and he says hey if you just go up this road about 10 minutes you're gonna see some of the most epic parts of Utah so I started on this road and 10 minutes turns into 20 
20 turns into 30, and I'm thinking, did this guy give me bad directions? Did I miss my turn? And all of a sudden, the pavement ends, and I'm on this dirt road. It's bumpy, it's uphill, it's just windy around this mountain. And I didn't have cell phone service, so I have no idea where I'm at. I get almost to the top, and I end up in a campground. I'm like, this is not what I wanted to see. There's this guy working on his trailer, and I rolled my window down. You could tell this dude's frustrated. Like, he did not want to be on this camping trip. And I was like, is there any scenic things around here? And he's like, dude, don't ask me. I just got up here. I'm trying to get set up. So I'm like, okay, maybe I should just go back down the hill. But something in my heart said, just go a little bit further. Just go a little bit further. I get up the hill. As I'm coming over, I saw this most beautiful, epic National Geographic cover worthy scene of a lake and this mountainside and these trees and I thought to myself I was so close to turning around but all I had to do was just go a little bit further to see this beauty maybe you're here today in the season you're in right now the roads feel windy and dirty and dusty and bumpy but my prayer for you is that God will give you endurance to just go a little bit further because on the other side of this, you're gonna see God's beauty in your life. You're gonna see him working and moving through your circumstances. Just keep going. I wanna take a moment and I wanna pray for our church family. If you're here today and you need God's help, I know this may be weird, but if I can say a prayer for you, would you just boldly slip your hand up in the air right where you're at? If you're next to somebody with their hand raised, let's stretch a hand out towards them. Let's just pray and let's ask God to do what only he can do. God, we thank you so much for taking our messy, our dirty circumstances and turning them into good. And I just pray for anybody in this room today that's struggling, that needs your help. Would you remind them you've not forgotten about us? God, you're here with us. Your presence is here. Lord, thank you for being a good God. Thank you for loving us unconditionally. For it's in your name we pray. Everybody said. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll.
Well, what an incredible time of worship. Before we continue in our experience, we want to give a shout out to everyone experiencing church today, especially those who are joining us at our physical church locations like Central Kingman. Shout out to you guys out there. And we also want to welcome those of you who are joining us online, like Bob watching in P.O., Sander in Wyoming, Judy in Ohio, and the Nemo family who's actually watching from the Children's Hospital right now. We are praying for you guys and we're so glad that you're joining us. We also want to give a shout out to everyone watching inside of a prison facility. Maybe you're watching through the Pando app, but you're definitely watching in our partnership with God Behind Bars. Yes. They make that possible. So thank you so much for being a part of the Central family as well. And at this time, we're kicking off a brand new series called Follow Him. So would you do me a huge favor and welcome up our senior pastor, Pastor Judd, as he shares with us a message of hope. All right. Good to see you guys. Glad to be here. What a joy to be with the Central family this weekend. We've had a few weekends off and uh, it's been really good for our soul, but it's always such a blessing to be back. I kind of feel like this summer was maybe the first time uh, while we were on break that I um, fully rested in the last two years with COVID and all of that. So it was really needed. And uh, wow, I thought the teaching this summer that happened here at Central was phenomenal. I watched Pastor Nick every weekend. And uh, he just did such a fantastic job. Every weekend I got something uh, meaningful and deep that I could walk away with. So thank you to Pastor Nick, and um, thank you for being here with us. I don't know if you got to travel much uh, this summer or got out, but uh, travel can be a little bit crazy. And I heard this story about a guy that um, this past summer went on a hiking trip, and he got lost, or at least they thought he got lost. He, he didn't come back to the main trailhead, and nobody kind of knew what happened to him, and eventually search and rescue got involved, and these five search and rescue people looked for him. They ended up looking for this guy all night long, and they would call him. They had his number, but, you know, they didn't get through to him. They didn't know what was happening, and, and then about 9.30 in the morning, he just sort of walks back up. <laughs> What's up? And they're all like, were you lost? And he goes, oh, yeah, I was totally lost. I had no idea where I was. And they're like, did, did, do you have your phone on you? He said, oh, yeah, I have my, my phone on me. And they said, well, we called you all night long. Why didn't you answer? He said, I didn't recognize that number. I'm not going to answer out here, you know. And all these people were commenting like, first of all, dude, seriously, answer your phone. And then other people were like, why didn't Search and Rescue just text him? You know. Uh, but I think the real culprit in the story is spam. It's the spam calls. Anybody getting a lot of spam? I'm getting spam calls left and right. And thankfully, my phone catches most of them and says, like, you know, spam, whatever it says, like, could be spam, possible spam, anything with spam, and I'm out. But uh, I think we all know what it is in our lives to have seasons where we're lost, Seasons where we don't know how to get through the situation that we're facing. Seasons where we aren't quite sure how to push through the problem that we're up against. And one of the things that Jesus says to people in the Gospels, in the biographies of Jesus in the Bible, to people who are lost is often two words. Follow me. Just follow me. It's not like a to-do list. Here's 15 things you need to do to no longer be lost. It's an invitation to a lifestyle. He's saying, follow me in your life and I can lead you to greater purpose, greater significance, greater meaning. And so I wanna talk with you over the next five weeks about some different encounters that Jesus has with people at different phases in their life where he says those words, follow me, follow me. And he leads them from that state of being lost to a state of being found. And the first person we want to look at today is a guy named Matthew. He wrote the first book of the New Testament called Matthew. That's right. Um, and he wrote about his own story of when he was called. And it's kind of fascinating. So we'll bring the scripture up on the side screen. We get to the red word. Say it real loud here with me. But uh, here, here's what it says. It says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. What? Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. 
Now, I don't know about you, but when I would read stories like this in the Bible, I always thought it was kind of interesting. I'm like, did Matthew just get up not knowing anything? It's like some dude just, look, if some dude walked up to me and said, follow me, I'd be like, no. <laughs> right? You know, you're like, what? did you ever think this when you're kind of reading this? Like, what's going on here, man? Follow me. And people are like, okay, I'll just follow him. You know, I'll just leave everything and follow him. Well, I actually think it's way more layered than that. You know, Jesus was very, his fame was growing. He was, uh, more and more people were talking about him. Matthew, and G Matthew may have known a lot about Jesus. He may have even heard Jesus teach. We don't really know. He may have even spoken with Jesus before this. But Jesus comes up to him and basically says, follow me in this moment. And Matthew is willing to step out and to do it. And so the first thing he's going to experience in following Jesus is friendship with God, and then he's going to share that friendship with others. So if we're going to follow him today, my first challenge is to simply share God's friendship. You know, when you, when you love somebody, you want to share things with them. The best thing that Lori and I did um, this past month was just uh, we got some time away with friends. And uh, we drove to Southern California. I saw my best friend for the last 20 plus years, uh, Mike Foster, and we just did nothing. You know, we sat around, we talked, we laughed. It was great. And I had planned this. I love records and vinyl. I'm kind of a, it's my, one of my hobbies. You know, I really enjoy it. So I bought him a record player and all the things that he would need and got him like starter records and he didn't know what hit him. And so I gave him all this stuff, you know, and we got it all hooked up into his system and just sitting there. I don't know if he really cares, but it meant a lot to me. I loved it. And I loved watching him go like, what is this? Because he didn't have any idea what he's doing. I'm like, well, you know, you take the needle and you put it down like this. These little grooves are the songs. I'm like, dude, when, when were you born? You know, like going through the whole thing. Anyway, I'm showing him the whole thing, right? And I'm loving it because... When you love somebody, when you're friends with somebody, you want to share things that, that bring you joy. You know, like you ever go to a restaurant and it's just amazing and you want to text somebody and say, oh my gosh, the food here was so good, right? Or you go to a movie and you're like, you got to see this movie. This movie was great. Every time I read a good book, everybody I know gets just driven crazy because I'm like, you got to check this book out. This book was awesome. I loved it. They're like, yeah, 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 whatever. But when you love things, you want to share them. Well, Matthew begins to grow in his relationship with God. He begins to follow Jesus and be transformed. And what does he want to do in that moment? He wants to not only share that friendship with God, he wants to share it with others. And so the very next sentence, this is what we read. Check it out. Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 10, it says, Later, later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his what? To his home. He invited them all into the house. But look at this. Along with many uh, tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love Matthew, right? What's Matthew doing? He's sharing the best thing that's happened in his life with his friends. And who are his friends? Disreputable sinners. He's a tax collector. We just read he was at his tax collector booth when Jesus came by and said, hey, follow me. Matthew is not the, you know, picture of the religious type. Let me kind of set it up for you. Tax collectors um, were hated in the Jewish world. I mean, they're not popular now. But it was way worse back then. Because if you were a Jewish person and you were ta collecting taxes from your fellow Jewish person under the military backing of the Roman Empire, you were seen as a traitor to your people. And there was a lot of squirrely stuff going on with taxes. And some of us wonder if that isn't happening still today. But anyway, back then, they would... Um, they would often take bribes from the wealthy and then they would um, falsify the documents and the records and they would make up the difference by taxing the middle class and the poorer class even more. People that collected taxes had more leeway to kind of make judgments and so they could tax, and you could get taxed for everything. You could get taxed for the fish that you catch. You could get taxed for where you park your boat. They tax you for your donkey, your horse, your animal. And so the Jewish people saw this as a corrupt system backed by Rome. They saw the corruption and they hated tax collectors, especially Jewish tax collectors, because it was like you're betraying your own people, collecting taxes, patting your own pockets at our expense. Now, there were tax collectors who were more wealthy, the big, the big people, and they would hire other people to collect taxes for them. And then there were the little people, and they worked their own booths and collected the taxes. Now, to tell you how bad it was at the time, like a Jewish person that was a tax collector wouldn't be welcome in the synagogue or the temple to worship. 
They were outsiders. They could not give testimony in a Jew, on the Jewish side because the Jews would have their own legal system and legal religious framework. They could not give testimony in a Jewish legal setting if they were a tax collector. You were out. And so you were hated and despised. And I mean, this is the last person we would expect Jesus to come up to and be like, yo, follow me. And Matthew gets up and follows him. And then he says, I'm going to throw a house party with my gang. And he invites all his friends over. And then Jesus goes and has dinner with them. And that's remarkable because when you look at it historically, like who a person ate with was a very big deal in the ancient world. Uh, we just kind of, you know, we'll eat with anybody. Hey, if you're buying, I'm eating. Right? You know what I mean? We don't really see it like, like that big of a deal. Like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll eat with you. Sure. Yeah. What are, what are you? You're buying? I'm in. But in the ancient world, this was a big deal. Who you ate with, that was an extension of friendship and even loyalty and trust. And so Jewish people, strict Jewish people, they would never eat with a tax collector or a disreputable sinner. Never. You wouldn't invite them to your table or, or even go to their table. Even today, an Orthodox Jewish person is very intentional about who they sit down and share a meal with. It's an expression of friendship and, and loyalty, and, and it's a bond that happens when you break bread together. So it was a sacred thing. And Matthew says, Jesus, come over to my house, this tax collector, and Jesus shows up. And did you notice it said he brought his disciples I promise you, his disciples are walking around like, what's happening right now? I don't know, man. <laughs> and the religious hear about this because the smaller communities and, you know, the gossip, 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 gossip goes around. And it's like, Jesus over at Matthew said, Matthew, that guy. And so they're bothered and they're disturbed by all of this. And the people that are most, bo most bothered were the religious leaders. Why is it that religious people, you and me, <laughs> why is it that we get the most bothered by these expressions of love that Jesus engages in towards people that we see as outsiders? Right? We often, if you follow Jesus long enough, here's what I can promise you. He will stretch you. He'll stretch your mind. He'll stretch your categories. He'll stress what you were raised to believe. He'll stress what, you know, he'll stress the racism that gets instilled in our hearts, even sometimes without us knowing it. He'll, he'll stretch the, the socioeconomic framework that we start to embrace by how we look at other people. He'll begin to stretch kind of your framework on what you uh, think about another person based on what they drive or what they wear or, or how they look. God will eventually blow that stuff up if you will follow him with an open heart. And Jesus' disciples were getting a firsthand lesson that, hey, God loves, God loves these people too. God cares about these people too. And it's a beautiful picture of the good news, the gospel, that God loves people so passionately. And that's why Christ came. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And my favorite part of that is the next sentence, John 3, 17, for he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus was a picture of the love of God, of the rescue of God for all of us. And he modeled it. And so Matthew says, man, come to my house and let's get to know Jesus. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but sometimes just throw on a dinner party of your own for your friends who may be in different places spiritually. Maybe some of them are what you would define as far from God. Maybe some of them aren't really at a place of faith. Just having them to, to your table and sitting down and eating and laughing. And if it's appropriate and God opens the door, just sharing what God's done in your own life. But just having them there can be a spiritual act. A house party can be a spiritual thing. That's what Matthew's throwing. And so... In this moment, all of these people come together and they sit around the table and he's sharing, Matthew is sharing the most important thing in his life. One of my convictions for this season in our church is that we just get back to the basics, the most important thing. And the most important thing, and I think in all of our lives, is Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. 
And it's simply sharing that good news, not in a way that offends people or scares them off or weirds them out, but just living it out naturally in our life and being aware that that we are the missionaries God has sent out into the world through loving other people, inviting them to your dinner party, inviting them to church, through praying regularly, God, give me an opportunity to share the story of what you've done in my life with somebody, to remembering who God is and and how he's moved and worked in our lives. That's what we have to be about as the church. Jesus gave us the great commission, and he told us to go into all the world and teach and to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and he said, behold, I will be with you always. And in any kind of military setting, when you hear a command from the the senior officer, you follow the command of the senior officer until you get a command from an officer who's higher than that. Come on. And there hasn't been anybody higher than that. And Jesus hasn't yet come back. So we still have a mission. We still have work to do. We still have a, a, a God to represent. And he can still change our lives. I've started carrying this around with me again. I go through different seasons where I carry it and then seasons where I forget it and it ends up in the drawer and then seasons where I get it out again. But this is my Celebrate Recovery chip. And I'm just carrying it. I mean, it's been over 30 years, y'all. That's a long time. But I carry this around as a reminder that God can rescue anybody. He rescued me. Come on. That God can move in anybody's life. He moved in my life. That I'm not better than anybody else, and I need his grace every single day. And Jesus is such a beautiful picture of it with who he goes to dinner with and who he sits at the table with and who he cares about. If we can help you follow him, we've said as a church that our mission is simply to introduce people to Jesus and help them follow him. That's all we're really trying to do. That's the main thing. Introduce people to Jesus and help them follow him. And I'm going to put a little slide up on the screen that just kind of walks through a pathway of what it could look like to follow Jesus. We call it a, a follow him pathway. But But it starts with discovering Jesus. And maybe you're even listening today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, but there will come a time where you begin to surrender your life and you you start that spiritual journey with God and you take that initial step of faith. And and maybe you you get baptized as a marker of following him. And maybe you jump into um, the first step where you learn more about just the basics of spiritual life and spiritual growth and and how you can get some tools to help you begin to grow. And you keep showing up on the weekends and, and you're growing now. You're, you're on the way. You're, you're on the journey. And then you, as you move along, you, get, you start to get to know Jesus. You build your foundations. And this can happen in a lot of ways, through group life, through men's or women's studies, through uh, uh, things in your life where you're growing and beginning to learn more about the Bible. We offer seminars through Central Academy where you can really get to know more of who Jesus is, um, the things like discovering your spiritual gifts or, or um, the life of Christ, all kinds of seminars that are available for free. Keep an eye out for those. Great opportunities to help you build those foundations. And you keep coming and you keep growing. And now you're walking with Jesus and you're on this kind of lifetime growth path. And we're here to help you with that in any way that we can. And of course, Central Academy, uh, we have a track, just a Bible track that you can take online or you can take live where you dig in and do a whole year through the Old and New Testament and just do a deep dive overview where you get a handle. Sometimes people get it for the very first First time on what sort of the whole story of the Bible is and how it can apply to your life. And then you keep going and then you get to leading like Jesus. So now you've been through all of this, you've grown, you've developed, you've learned, God's done a work in your life. And he hasn't done that just so you can hold on to it. Now you're leading like him. You're passing that on. You're passing it on to your kids, to your friends, to your group, to people that you're interacting with. Maybe you're leading and teaching and volunteering and serving and God is using you. And if we can help you with that, we have a whole track in Central Academy. Academy that's just a year dedicated to leadership and developing your leadership skills and helping you begin to show those in the lives of others, which can help not only in the workplace, but also in the church world as well as you're leveraging those gifts. But we're here to follow Jesus in our lives and to just commit to him and to know that no matter where you've been or what you've done, he loves you 
and he wants you to follow him. According to Luke 15, 2, the religious leaders accused Jesus because he, quote, welcomes sinners and eats with them. And that's how scandalous it was. That was their main accusation. Today we'd hear that and we'd be like, so? Right? But back then, that was the big ammo. He welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Can you imagine? The term welcomed used in Luke 15 too could be translated take great pleasure in. And I kind of love that. Jesus didn't simply endure people who were a mess. He took great pleasure in them. He took great pleasure in being around them. Some of you, maybe you even came to church today and you got in the car or you popped on online and you've had a tough week and maybe you've done some things you regret and, and you have this sense hanging over you that, that God, maybe, maybe he'll endure you, maybe he'll let you get through another week or another season in your life if you'll just lean in, but everything in you wants to run because of all the junk going on in your heart. And I wanna remind you today that the perfect image of God, the Bible tells us in Hebrews, was represented in Jesus Christ, that he is the exact image of the invisible God. And what does Jesus teach us about God? He teaches us that God took delight in people, messy people, broken people, disreputable people. He loves people, and he loves you. He loves you in all your junk, in all your brokenness, in all the shame, in all the mistakes, in all the failures. He loves you, and he loves me. And when you settle into that, it'll change your life. It'll change you from the inside out. It's hard to hate when you start to experience that kind of love. It's hard to judge when you start to experience that kind of love. It's hard to look down your nose at other people when you experience that kind of love. So share God's friendship. Here's another thought following him, and that is to just remember your rescue. Remember your rescue. I don't know if you've ever been snubbed just felt like somebody's looking down their nose at you. Somebody kind of blows you off. I think I get, I got triggered this summer when somebody cut me off on the, on the freeway and they were right on my bumper, you know, that guy. And I'm like, dude, I'm trying to get over. I can't get out of his way. And then when I finally do, he like almost clips my bumper to go around me and then makes a big effort to let me know how frustrated he was that I delayed him by 10 seconds. And it's just triggering. You know, it took everything in me not to full-on road rage this guy. And I thought later, like, why does that affect me? So it's because you feel disrespected. You feel like, man, and it's dangerous. You could hurt people. And so all of that, none of us like that sense of being judged or triggered. I was talking to a friend this week. He said he and his wife went to look at some new model homes just to kind of look, you know, and kind of tour this little thing. And you walk in, and you know, there's the salesperson, and then there's the three or four model homes that you can walk through. And he said, as soon as we walked in, we just felt like she looked at us right down her very long nose <laughs> and was like, oh, you just want to look, huh? because there's no way you could afford to actually buy one of these houses. That, he said that was just the whole attitude. And so they looked at the houses, and the whole time it was comment after comment and just snarky, you know. And at the end, she says, well, maybe someday. And they walk out, and his sweet wife, precious family, God-fearing family, his sweet wife says, someday I'm going to make a whole lot of money just so I can not buy one of their houses. <laughs> Because <laughs> nobody likes it when people look down their nose at you, right? Nobody likes it when you feel like, man, I'm being judged in this moment. And in Jesus' story, there's some judging going on, but it's not Jesus. He's not the one judging. It's the religious people who are judging. Check it out. Matthew chapter 9, verse 11. This is what happens. Matthew 9, verse 11. It says, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples. They didn't go to Jesus. They went to the disciples, a little safer. Why does your teacher eat with such scum? Wow. That's some deep-seated stuff, isn't it? 
Why do you eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Now there's a lot here. First of all, in this moment, Jesus says, um, he's come that the healthy don't need. By the way, it was you know, very kind of him to put it this way. It was kind of brilliant. The healthy don't need a doctor, the sick do. If you ask me, the religious people were sick, but Jesus didn't go there. What's the qualification for coming to Jesus, experiencing his forgiveness, experiencing his mercy? It's really just acknowledging that you're a sinner, that you need his mercy and you need his grace. And so Jesus says, I've come to call the sick, those who are hurting, those who need God's grace and mercy. And the truth is, we all need that in our lives. But the religious leaders are the ones who are so bothered in this moment. And then Jesus says, go and learn the meaning of this scripture. And the scripture that he quotes is from the Old Testament book of Hosea. Um, and it's about not offering sacrifices, but showing mercy. And the whole idea uh, in the book is that the Old Testament people of God were offering sacrifices and jumping through all the religious hoops, right? They were going to church, they were tithing, they were doing all the things, but they didn't have mercy for other people. They didn't have love anymore for other people. And he's like, look, you missed the point. All that's fine, but the point is mercy for other people people. And I wonder if that's a message for us today, and myself included, as a religious person, as a faith person. Can I get so caught up in all that God has done in my life that I've forgotten my own rescue? Can I get so caught up in the, the mileage that I've traveled that I've forgotten what it's like to be on the other side of that equation? And can I start looking down at other people? And can I start judging them? doesn't take long for religious people to get to a place where they're saying, why do you eat with such scum? And that's where the religious leaders were. Now, they did all the sacrifices. They knew their Bibles in and out. They tithed. They gave financially. They, they, they showed up at, at, at uh, synagogue and temple. They jumped through all the religious hoops, but they lost the heart of mercy. And we got to remember our own rescue. Remember that time when Jesus said to you and to me, follow me. Follow me even though you don't have life figured out. Follow me even though you may have regret in your life. Follow me even though you may have hurt others or you may have been hurt. Follow me even though you may have broken promises. Follow me even though you have let fear get the best of you. Follow me even though you can't control your anger. Follow me even though you have a lot of shame. Follow me out of your, your, your abuse. Follow me out of your self-sabotage. Follow me out of your pessimism and out of your victimhood and out of your low self-worth. Follow me into a new life and a new community and a new love and a new purpose. When Jesus said that to me, when he said it to you, we didn't deserve it. I don't deserve everything. You know, you know, I don't deserve anything. You know what I thought when I was coming to church today? I just thought, man, thank you. I get to see another day. I get to be with my family at church. I get to worship a God I don't deserve to worship. I mean, it's all a gift. And it goes back to the call of Jesus. And I believe he's calling every single one of us today to follow him. Whatever location you're at right now, I just want you to look around. I want you to look around at the empty seats. The seats where nobody's at. Some of you just went. I'm praying that God will fill these seats this next season. I've been in ministry 30 years. I'm not praying that for my ego. I could, it's not about me. I'm not praying it because it makes things easier. It doesn't. It makes things more complicated. I'm praying it because people need the love of Jesus. They need the call in their life that we heard and it transformed their life. And that's the only reason. But I want to ask you to join me. 
going forward. Each day, will you add to your prayer list a simple prayer saying, God, fill the seats at our locations. God, bring people to you and entrust us with discipling them along in the way of you. God, will you, will you use me and my story? Will you just pray, God, sh give me an opportunity to share my faith story today. Give me an upright. Pray for individuals in your life. You know, we can all affect somebody. There's somebody in all of our lives who may not know the Lord, who may not be walking with the Lord. God, just look, give me an opportunity and show me when the opportunity is right. I'm not going to barge in. I'm not going to hit them over the head with the Bible. I'm not going to like spiritually beat them to death. I'm going to wait and pray and ask for the opportunity. And when the opportunity is right, God, make it clear to me and let me step in and offer an invitation. Bring them along to church with you or an invitation to start a Bible study with you or an invitation just to meet regularly and talk about what's going on in their spiritual journey, something. God, I'm just going to open my heart to be on mission with you. Every year at Central, there's a poem that's my favorite poem. For years, I had it on my office wall. I've almost got it memorized. Uh, it's by Samuel Shoemaker, and I always read it around this time. And I want to share it with you again. It's called, I Stand at the Door. And it's kind of my life's motto. But I think it also incorporates the heart of our church in so many ways. He says, so I stand by the door. I neither go in too far nor stay too far out. The door is the most important door in the world. It's the door through which people walk when they find God. There's no use going way inside and staying there when so many are outside who crave to know where the door is. People die outside the door, like starving beggars die on cold nights in cruel cities in the dead of winter. They die for want of something that is within their grasp. But they live on the other side of it. They live because they found it. Nothing else really matters compared to helping them find it and open it and walk in and find Jesus. So I stand at the door. I admire the people who go way in, but I wish they wouldn't forget how it was before they got in. Hello. Then they would be able to help the people who have not even yet found the door or the people who want to run away again from God. You can go in too deeply and you can stay in too long and you can forget the people outside the door. So as for me, I shall take my old accustomed place near enough to God to hear him and know that he is there, but not so far from people as not to hear them and remember that they are there too. Where? Outside the door. Thousands of them, millions of them, but more important for me, one of them, two of them, four of them, whose hands I am intended to take and put on the latch so I will stand by the door and I will wait for those who seek it I'd rather be a doorkeeper I stand by the door we're a church of doorkeepers we're a church that's open and open to everybody we don't judge we don't make preconceived decisions. We don't give people a to-do list. We just want to open the door. Let them figure it out with Jesus. It's what he did with us. And that's what he can do with them. So maybe this week in your life, if you could just join me in firing up your prayer life again for the opportunity to share your faith with somebody. Maybe just join me in recommitting to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand by the door and I'm going to help somebody else, God willing, experience what I've experienced. Maybe there's a token that you could carry around again in your life just to remind you of your rescue, like my recovery chip is to remind me of mine. 
something to remind you that look, if God did it in my life, he can do it in theirs. And what a privilege it would be to be a part of that in their story. Maybe you're here today and maybe you've never crossed the line of faith and I'd love to give you that opportunity to just open your heart to God and come back to him and ask him to move and work in your life. I believe Jesus loves you and I believe what he says to you today is follow me, follow me. And he'll come in in your life. He'll sit at the table with you and with your friends (laughs) and he'll share the goodness of God with you. If you're here and God's been moving in your life and you're ready to receive him, I want to lead you in a simple prayer just to open your heart to him and ask him to move and work in your life. So would all of you bow your heads and close your eyes. If you'd like to become a follower of Jesus, you can begin that journey by repeating a simple prayer after me to say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name. And friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, if it's your commitment, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air. and Just reach out to God right where you're at today. Just slip your hand in the air. God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for each person just reaching out to you, and I pray you'll, you'll show up and work in their life and move and forgive and restore and heal. And God, send them on the awesome journey of following you. We thank you that every day we get to get up and follow you and trust you in our lives. We're so grateful to know you. We give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Let's put our hands together for those who made spiritual commitments in their life today. If you made a spiritual commitment after our services are over, I want to encourage you just to go out to the next step area. Let them know you made a spiritual commitment. We would love to give you a free gift, a little journal we've created called How to Follow Jesus. Also, answer any questions you may have or help you on the spiritual journey. You can also go to central.family and click the link, I've Decided to Follow Jesus, and we can give that to you, get that uh, journal to you digitally as well. Well, at this time, let's put our, hand together, put our hands together for each of our locations as they come to close out their experiences. Come on, church. Let's go. What an incredible message from Pastor Judd. We're so glad that you joined us for this awesome weekend. Before you go, don't forget that first step is coming up. And even though it's a few weeks away, you want to make sure you get registered right now. This is an easy opportunity to take a next step, learn more about Central, and grow in your faith. And simply, it's a great next step to follow him. It's happening on August 27th from 12 to 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And you can join in from any anywhere around the world. All you have to do is visit central.family and click first step. We would love to have you join us for that. Well, thanks again for joining us this weekend. As you go through your week, remember to hang on to what Romans 8 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Keep showing up.